Hello, this is Brian Mounts. I run TurfMechanic.com and the Turf Mechanic YouTube channel. I also am an avid bowler. Most of my subscribers know lots about me. They know about my enjoyment of battery powered lawn and garden equipment, tending to the grass, but this is new. Uh, one of these days I'll have to talk a little bit more about bowling, but today I don't want to talk about bowling at all. This is just the backdrop for humic acid. Humic acid is something that has been used in the agricultural industry for decades, and I would wager to say that only within the past five to ten years has this been a a uh, common kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a fad product, but it's kind of like a new product that's being used in the lawn and garden space. Almost all of the companies these days make some sort of humic acid, fulvic acid product to put on the lawn. Um, there are commercial products out there, and then there are lots of products like these and many others that are designed for the homeowner. I don't really want to talk today about what humic acid does. I know it makes sense to talk about what it does. I'm going to save that for another video down the road. Please hit the subscribe button and you'll catch that when it, when it comes out. There's a little notification bell too. You can be notified. Um, make sure to hit that. But today I want to talk about where the stuff comes from. Like seriously, what is humic acid? What's full of acid? Where does it come from? Here I've got the next product. Uh, this is their Humic 12 product. Probably right there on it, it says it is derived from Leonardite. Leonardite. I seriously, I've been trying, I've been like telling, saying that out loud over and over and over for like a week and a half straight. I can't ever get it out of my mouth. Leonardite. It was named after a guy named Leonard. So what is it? What's Leonardite? Leonardite is, it's a stage. So there are, uh, there are plants. Let's say 50 million years ago, this swampy plant. Have you ever been to like the swamplands south, southeast of uh, New Orleans? You know what I'm talking about. These like swampy, wet places. Um, and all of the vegetation, as it dies, it falls into that water and it gets covered up. Now, over about a thousand years, all of that dead plant that go into the water will slowly turn into what we call peat or peat moss. This is the, the stuff that we, that we dredge out and package it up into like big, huge bricks and we use it as a growing medium or we use it as kind of a, a soil amendment because it holds and retains water. It has no nutrient value whatsoever. Uh, but it takes about a thousand years to create uh, three to four feet of this stuff. Now, what would happen if we didn't use that, if we didn't dredge it up and package it up and sell it off the stores? Well, eventually, after about 40 million more years, this stuff starts transforming into brown coal, the earliest, youngest stage of coal. And that is called lignite. Lignite is, uh, it is a fuel source. Um, it can be used just like coal. The difference is it doesn't, it's not as dense. It's not as heavy. It's got uh, a lower carbon um, uh, consistency. Um, it hasn't extracted all of its other elements out of it. So all the, uh, all the oxygen and the hydrogen and all that, Everything hasn't pulled out of it yet, so it, it's not all carbon. Uh, but it is dense enough and coal enough to be used as an energy source. Okay, so in between peat and in between lignite, there is leonardite. Leonardite hasn't even yet become kind of this crumbly rock that lignite is. And it's more substantial than kind of the fluffy uh, growing medium that we think of when we think of peat. It's kind of in between. It really is. It's kind of like this dusty, dirty, sandy kind of black material. Peat doesn't have any nutrients in it at all. 
lignite and all other forms of more advanced forms of coal also don't have any nutrients in it. So as you would expect, the uh, leonardite also doesn't have any nutrients in it. However, the metamorphosis process of turning into coal hasn't begun or hasn't advanced enough to take those humic acids, the, um, and we call it an acid. It's not actually an acid. Like, it's not like, you know, it's not an acid per se, but molecularly, the way that the chains are made, they are not regular. They're not this repeating pattern of molecular chains. It's all a little bit different. So I don't know why, but they call it an acid. The fulvic acids are these molecules that are just kind of, let's call them chaotic. They're probably not chaotic, but as a fulvic acid is continually being compressed uh, by sediment and rock layers for millions of years, those molecules will slowly start binding and then they turn into humic acids. And those molecules are kind of chaotic too and they're binding and they're getting bigger and eventually they start bonding together and the whole thing metamorphosizes, if that's a word, into the early stages of coal. So in the Leonardite, Leonardite stage, we are able to extract these acids, the, uh, the fulvics and the humics, we're able to extract them through processing that I am not capable of doing here in my garage. Um, there are factories that do this, and all of these all of these companies basically do that. They take the leonardite and they process it, and they pull the acids out, the humics and the fulvic out. They usually package them up together because humics are water soluble at a high pH range, so and fulvics are water soluble at any range because they haven't changed into humics yet. As they extract the humics, the fulvics come with them. Now in post-processing, they can go and separate those two. However, that's not usually very advantageous. It's not usually helpful for anyone in any setting. Uh, there are some advocates out there for applying only humic to certain crops at certain times of the year, and there are some advocates for only doing fulvic. But the simple fact of the matter is, both fulvics and, and humics, they kind of work together and they're different stages of the exact same stuff. A fulvic, because the molecules have been binding for a shorter amount of time, or they have like, they haven't, they haven't like achieved the girth of the humic um, molecular binding situation there, the fulvics are actually smaller and they're able to be absorbed into the plant. So common theory is the fulvic acids allow for nutrient uptake because the the fulvics are able when they're in the the soil of your lawn or your garden or whatever your setting is the fulvics are able to go down into the soil and then they get absorbed up into the plant through the root system and as they do that they can open up those roots to uh, almost like uh, almost like you wring a sponge out and then that sponge is able to pick up more stuff because you wrung it out. Some, something about those fulvics, they open up the pores of those roots so that more can come in. Popular thought with the humics is that the humic acid, because those molecules are a little bit bigger, they don't actually go into the plant so well or at all. They reside in the soil. And as they say, as they stay in the soil, they allow for activity from the microbes in the soil to be able to feed um, and grow and you can get worms and you can get bacteria and beneficial fungi and all of these things that are in the ground simply because the humic acid resides in the soil. Now, humic acid is frequently used as a soil amendment. It's frequently billed as a uh, soil conditioner, as an aerator, and it's mostly because, not because it's in the soil, because it stimulates so much activity in the soil that all of the activity breaks the bonds of the soil around and it allows the soil to aerate and become more alive. 
So the humic doesn't really change the soil. The humic is the reason that the soil gets changed by other things. These products, you got Next, I got this product, it's a granular. This is a different company, ChemWise, from Simple Plant Food. Uh, they build there's a simple aeration. Um, this is a concentrate of 6% liquid. Um, this is a concentrate of 12% liquid humic. Uh, the rest of it is water, and this is mostly the rest of it is water. There's a couple other little things in there too. Uh, this is the same company here. Uh, next RGS, this is 6% humic with some extra things in it. Um, this is a granulus, this is 50% humic. So this is a good example of how these products are made because when they go through processing and when the humic is extracted and that fulvic is extracted you know, together, these products turn into this slurry, this really black dark, syrupy, molasses looking slurry. From that point, they can be diluted into products like this, these liquid products, or they can be dehydrated and turned into powders and granulars like this. This granular is 50%. Now there are other products out there that are, um, they're basically granular uh, products that will disperse in water. Like for instance, you buy a package of kind of powderized uh, humic, dried humic, and then you can mix it yourself in your own tank, whether it be a pump spray or a big backpack or a handheld. However you do it, you take that powder and you can mix it yourself. Now those save a lot of, um, they, they save a lot of storage space. They save a lot of costs in shipping and packaging and, and weight, uh, toting them around, but they do add the extra step of when I want to apply the product, I gotta go mix it. So. Um, this product right here, I don't have to mix with water. This you can throw into a spreader and just walk around your yard spreading it just like you would grass seed or some other granular fertilizer. These you need a, uh, a dedicated sprayer. Um, I have used hose in sprayers, I've used pump sprayers, I've got a battery power, I love my battery powered equipment, I've got a battery powered um, kind of continuous sprayer uh, that I've been using lately. These need um, fancier equipment. Let's put it like that. They need fancier equipment to spray, but they're easier to do. I mean, you just throw it in the sprayer and you go. Uh, so where does humic acid come from? It comes from Leonardite. Leonardite is somewhere between a few million years and, three mil and 30 million years old. Like, it just is. Uh, Leonardite tends to be found in coal mines near the surface, so it hasn't oxidized as much. There's more oxygen still in it, so it hasn't changed into, um, into the brown coal that's being pulled out of the mine. Uh, it's a different product. In future videos, I'm going to go into more about why we use humic acid. Now, that was a lot of information on to where it comes from and how it's made, how it's processed. In future videos, I'm gonna talk about why we use it. Why do we care? Why is it important? Uh, I think that is probably more important than where it comes from. But it is complicated to understand where it comes from because it took me a long time to figure this out. So over on my website, I've got a very structured post. Um, I'll put a link to it, I don't know, on the screen and probably down in the description. Um, but it's a descriptive post about everything. Uh, where uh, humic comes from and what we use it for and why. So make sure to check that out. But definitely hit that like button and the subscribe button so that you can watch the future, future videos as they come out. There's way too much to say about this to just cram it into a single video. And I know there's a lot of YouTube videos out there on humic that really try to do it all in one, but there's just so much about it. Um, it is such a useful product that is not even a fertilizer. Like it's crazy. Like it doesn't actually do anything to the grass or to the plants that it goes on. It just affects everything else. So that's why it's important. We'll get to that in greater detail in the next video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day. I hope you enjoy the time that you have out of your lawn.